today's wonderful solemnity of the ascension of Jesus Christ is really doctrinally about so many wonderful things. So many wonderful things. First, in his ascension, we find the completion of our Lord's earthly mission, which sacred tradition tells us was some 33 years. And likewise, within that, his three years of public ministry, the last of those 33 years, so beautifully recalled in the Luminous Mysteries of the Rosary, are also completed. It's nice to recall that the Luminous Mysteries, his three years of public ministry, are completed with today's feast because it's the month of May, the month of Mary. And the first of the Luminous Mysteries, the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan by his cousin, John the Baptist, is beautifully depicted in this large portrait to my right. Second, with Jesus' ascension into heaven, the Paschal Mystery is completed. That four-event event of our Lord's passion, death, resurrection, and ascension into heaven by which he redeems and saves us. And this, after his 40 days of appearing in his post-resurrection accounts, huh? his post-resurrection appearances. And so our redemption is accomplished with today's feast, made a solemnity being celebrated today on this Sunday. Third, with the Feast of the Ascension, we have Christ ascending to be seated definitively at the right hand of his Father in heaven. He will not be seen again in his human nature's stature or form until his second coming at the general judgment. True, we have him in his Eucharistic form, body, blood, soul, and divinity, in the Most Holy Eucharist. But in his human nature's stature and form, from his ascension, he will not be seen again thus until his second coming. But what I want to focus on today is a fourth important point doctrinally, one that I love very, very much. And it's the fact that through our Lord's ascension into heaven in his human nature, our Lord opens our own path, mine and yours, and yours, and brothers, and fathers, our own human nature's path into the heavenly sanctuary, eternal beatitude, the beatific vision, heaven for all eternity. Heaven for all eternity for the human person. Pope St. Leo the Great says the ascension is not only about our Lord's divinity ascending to heaven, no but also about our humanity being admitted to seat itself at the right hand of the Father in heaven. Wow. Through Christ's own humanity, our humanity knows no limits, no bounds as of today's feast. St. Augustine says, for although he ascended alone, we also ascend because we are in him by grace and human nature. One form of the general intercessions for the Ascension Mass today reads, King of glory, through your ascension, you took with you our own frail humanity to be glorified in heaven. Frail humanity. And another part of the Mass, a special insert during the Roman canon, Eucharistic Prayer 1, which we will hear today, makes special mention of our weak human nature called to be glorified. Frail humanity, weak human nature. Why? Because we're still living in this broken, wounded world resultant to the fall of our first parents, the original sin. But that doesn't negate the greatness we're called to in heaven. The Collect Prayer for today's Mass just chanted, said, quote, for the ascension of Christ is our exaltation. And a preface of Easter, which is recommended as we approach the ascension in Pentecost, says, through him, Christ, through him, 
the children of light rise to eternal life and the halls of the heavenly kingdom are thrown open to the faithful. The halls of the heavenly kingdom are thrown open to the faithful. This is one time where I wish I was on a liturgical commission or committee for English translation of the liturgy because I would love to put the word wide in front of open. Through him, Christ, the children of light rise to eternal life and the halls of the heavenly kingdom are thrown wide open to the faithful. Talking about today's feast of the ascension. The main point here, we are indeed made for heaven, my friends, and the ascension reminds us so beautifully, so doctrinally of this fact that our gaze is to be fixed on Christ's human nature in glory in heaven. Even as we labor tirelessly now, still living on earth in this present age, while still living in this broken, wounded world, these truths are truths we cannot lose sight of, huh? The Feast of the Ascension of our Lord commemorates the bodily ascent of Jesus into heaven after his glorious resurrection from the dead. Having completed his earthly mission, Jesus returned to heaven and to his heavenly Father with his eternal human body. In this way, he opens up the gates of heaven to all of us and shows us precisely what awaits our own glorious bodies. The Feast of the Ascension is for all Christians then a symbol of great, great hope because it reminds us that Christ sits at his Father's right hand in his human nature per se, in his human body per se, not negating the divinity of Christ, not at all, he's God. Yet in his human nature and in his human body, interceding even still on our behalf. What hope that is, despite any experience you have right now of this broken, wounded world in which, praise God, you're still alive in. After his resurrection into heaven, we know that Jesus spent 40 days with his disciples, and during that time, his glorified, resurrected body was veiled under the ordinary appearances of humanity, But after his final words to his disciples, which we heard in today's first reading from Acts 1, the New Testament reports, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. So as we are members of Christ's risen body, the church, we await too the day when we will be able to enter into the heavenly sanctuary, enter into that eternal happiness, by his side in heaven, huh? So the ascension testifies that after Jesus, I love this, after Jesus, human nature henceforth knows no bounds. Human nature, after Jesus' ascension, human nature henceforth knows no bounds. It is enthroned at the right hand of the Father in the communion of the Holy Spirit. This is why Pope St. Leo the Great says, with all due solemnity today, we are commemorating that day by which our own poor human nature was carried up in Christ above all the heavenly hosts of angels in heaven, above all the ranks of angels, beyond the heavenly powers, to the very throne of God the Father to be seated at his right hand. It is upon this ordered structure of divine acts that we have been firmly established as though upon a solid foundation. (laughs) Try blowing that one up. It is upon this ordered structure of divine acts that we have been firmly established as though upon a solid foundation. (laughs) Thus the ascension as St. John Paul II says, indicates the very goal, the very goal to which personal and universal history is hastening toward. Heavenly glory, eternal beatitude, and the beatific vision. 
what a beautiful message for human nature today amidst a culture of death, veritably speaking. A veritable culture of death. What a beautiful message for the body, literally the body. My body, your body. All of our literal bodies that show forth beautifully this human nature. So with all these beautiful truths said and and having them brought to the fore of our intellects with great faith this morning in the beautiful liturgical readings, the liturgical prayers, the spoken word, it's important to remember then, for example, when dealing with an unplanned pregnancy, vis-a-vis abortion, huh? When dealing with end-of-life issues, vis-a-vis euthanasia, when dealing with openness to life within the covenant of marriage, vis-a-vis should we contracept or not, temporarily or permanently through sterilization, when looking to natural law to support the sanctity of marriage and family life in human biology, when striving to heal broken families, fatherless families, motherless families, when striving to heal from clerical abuse scandals or recovery from recreational drug abuse or prescription drug abuse, when striving for freedom from addictions like internet pornography and alcoholism, human trafficking, and the sex and slave trades, the homeless crisis and the like. My friends, we are called to so much more. And today's great feast so beautifully, so doctrinally, just echoes all of this out with the shouts of gladness that we heard beautifully chanted during the responsorial psalm. Our God mounts his throne amidst shouts of joy, a blare of trumpets for the Lord. I like to think of that responsorial psalm as him shouting all these beautiful truths about human nature and the human body out to us. We are called to so much more. And with Corpus Christi coming up, (laughs) this is why the Eucharist worthily received is so important as the source and summit of the Christian life because the Eucharist is also about body. His body, his blood, his soul, his divinity. Truly, really, substantially present in sacramental Eucharistic form. It's also about body. Maybe this is why Holy Mother Church places the solemnity of Corpus Christi so soon after the Ascension to remind us of the beauty of the body. And the devil hates human nature. He's hated it ever since the day that he found out that God himself would assume it. God's going to make a creature higher than me, Satan said. (laughs) I know who my enemy's going to be then. He hates human nature. He hates the body. He hates the soul. Again, John Paul II, now saint, the ascension indicates the goal to which personal and universal history is hastening toward heavenly glory, eternal beatitude, and the beatific vision. Our human nature is meant for this eternal glory. What about tragedies and accidents, even sudden ones that come without any warning, like a car accident or just finding out you have terminal cancer that's not curable, a a tragedy or an accident that just hits suddenly? How about things like that? Because those things are part of the broken, wounded world too, right? How do they fit into all of this, that is, into the doctrine of the ascension of our Lord and the exaltedness of human nature and what it's called to in heaven for all eternity. 
Well, again, Pope St. Leo the Great talking about the passion and death of our Lord witnessed by the apostles and then the resurrection and then the ascension. Pope Leo the Great talking about that sequence of our Lord's events for us, all part of the Paschal Mystery, says this, the blessed apostles together with all the others had been intimidated by the absolute catastrophe of the cross which they witnessed. I've never heard of the crucifixion defined as an absolute catastrophe. But it must have been horrific that day on Mount Calvary. The blessed apostles, together with all the others, had been intimidated by the absolute catastrophe of the cross which they witnessed. And so their faith in the resurrection had been uncertain at first. But now they were so strengthened by the evident truth that when their Lord ascended into heaven before their eyes, that far from feeling any sadness, they were instead filled with great joy. It's like the ascension puts the seal of approval on the beauty and reality of the resurrection. So that their faith in the resurrection, which had been uncertain at first, was now so strengthened by the evident truth as our Lord ascended into heaven, that far from feeling any sadness, they were filled with great joy. And this after the absolute catastrophe of the cross. Huh? Kimberly Shankdown, and I close with this, is the academic dean of Benedictine College in Atchison, Kansas. She lives in Atchison, Kansas with her husband, and both of them care for their disabled son. And she writes this in a short essay titled, Opening the Gate. Opening the Gate. The Feast of the Ascension seems bittersweet. Jesus, after all, really leaves his disciples, and this time they know he's not coming back. They are promised the Holy Spirit, but the man that they love isn't there anymore following the ascension. So I never really was crazy about this feast. But after the accident that left my son totally disabled, I pondered on what it really means to open the way for the Holy Spirit. My son was a warm, funny, ornery, occasionally obnoxious teenager And yet, in the twinkling of an eye, that person was gone. And I mourned him. I wanted him back. The ascension helps me make sense of all of this. It shows the pattern for God's action in the world. Because before, the disciples could see Christ's power only in his presence when he was present. The worst thing they could imagine then was his absence. Yet the ascension allowed them to stop clinging to his physical appearance. It opened the door for the disciples and apostles to go forth now and remake the world. So our worst can become the gateway to unimaginable blessings. Before the accident of my son, the worst thing I could imagine was my son with a brain injury. Now, though, I see it differently. We are surrounded by love and support. My son knows without question that he is loved unconditionally, and many people, even those we've never met, tell us that praying for him has brought them closer to Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit chose a particularly dramatic way to demonstrate it, but letting go of my vision of my son's future and instead trusting the merciful providence that guides us has been that beautiful gateway. And our lives are abundantly blessed. And so now, I love the ascension. God bless you.